Hello, and welcome to Stuff We Play, home of everything weird and retro. As always, I'm Jamie, your host and resident Visco Girl. So today, after nearly three years, I'm doing a tour of my house and my YouTube slash gaming setup. I did one of these back in 2017, right after I moved in this current place, and then I was hoping to make this a regular thing, along with showing up to collection I had in storage at my parents' place. That didn't pan out, and now I'm hopefully moving out of this current house uh, in the next few months or so. So, I'm going to be dividing this video into three parts. A tour of the house proper, a showcase of my game room slash YouTube setup, and then finally, I'll be sitting down to, an to answer about 20 or so questions that viewers like you have asked me, just because, I mean, why not? So this is Jamie's Epic House Tour 2021 Edition. So let's start off with the basics. This right here is a rather recent addition to my setup. Uh, this is a Power Mac G4 from 2001. It's a Quicksilver edition that was literally given to me by a neighbor who was just moving out. This has been sitting in his closet since 2008, and it's a pretty beefy PC. It has a zip drive, a DVD drive, it has uh, two hard drives, 240 total gigs of storage. I have my PSP Go on top. Very nice, very nice. Look at that, look at that nugget. Nugget. And uh, what's funny is one of the two hard drives in here was filled with Studio Ghibli films, which, uh, or Ghibli films, I should say. So yeah, it's also a vintage Mac, which means I can play such classics as The Oregon Trail and uh, Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo. God have mercy. So, next up, we have the kitchen. Do you know what I do in here? That's right, nothing, because I don't cook. Next up, we have the living room proper. Now. You might think, wow, this is a game space, but rather what I like to do in here is I like to use my choice of the PS3, Switch, PSTV, PS4, Xbox One, Commodore 64 Mini, PlayStation Classic on occasion if I'm really in the mood, but you really gotta get me in the mood for it, or Wii to use as a fireplace. Or if I don't want that fireplace, I use a Switch. And since I put some mood music on as well using the record player, uh, I like to listen to really somber, uh, chill music, like... The soundtrack to Sonic Mania. Now legit, uh, I do like my records, but more often than not, if I'm listening oh. to music, I actually have, let me get to a place that's not filled with glare, this, which is actually an old school iPod, just a four gigabyte model, filled with songs. It's actually really nice. I really like having a dedicated music player for the living room. I feel like that's a very old school thing to have. Uh, and yeah. Now, in that ottoman right next to the couch, that's where I keep all my Wii and Wii U games, which was especially nice back when I had the Wii U down here, but now that's upstairs. I also have my N64 games over here, because I used to have that here. Uh, my Nintendo Switch games, my copy of Amiibo Festival, because I don't know where else to play, uh, put it, and a whole third of my Xbox One collection. <laughs> I only own three games on Xbox One because I bought that thing mostly just to use it as a Game Pass machine. Now before we go upstairs, there are two other things I want to show off. First, my media tower, which I use for Vita games and CDs, and also just to put away whatever I'm playing right now. Uh, and the main reason for that is just easy access and also because I didn't know where else to put the Vita games. The final thing I want to mention is that... Uh, I have this poster here, signed by Tracy Moore, who's the original English voice of Sailor Moon, uh, from when I did a charity event a few years back at a local game shop. And it's really cool, she's super sweet. And yeah, the, uh, oh, I take that back, there is one last thing. This right here is storage, I keep my bikes in here. I also have a G3 Power Mac that has a monitor. If I keep that in there and the G4 out here, because that one might look a little dirty, the G3 I found next to a frickin' dumpster. I can't believe it powers on. It's dirty. I'm worried I might need a tetanus booster every time I touch it. Okay, so anyways, let's go upstairs. Now, here comes Justin. At the top of the staircase, you know, it's just like going into Dracula's castle. We have, um... Let's not talk about that. 
Next to that, we have Detroit. And here's the thing about Detroit, uh, don't go in there. You can't have shit in there. Now, this here, this is a sign we have on here because back in the pre-COVID times, I never bothered to take it down. We'd have the occasional dinner party and, uh, this is basically my fiance, who's currently stuck in the States due to the border closure, yikes. An eyes way of saying, it, it's usually a mess in there. Please don't come in. But no, if we go in, I actually cleaned it up just for this video. So, first off, we have my classic CRT with my Sega Genesis Tower of Power hooked up to it. Uh, this is actually the full Genesis CD 32X setup. Has Knuckles Chaotix on it. And next to it, we actually have a shoe rack that uh, I use partially for shoes and then also partially for uh, overflow consoles that can't fit in the main room. So I have the Pikachu N64, the Hyperscan, one of three GameCubes I own, the 360, the PS1 with the flip top screen, which is a personal favorite of mine, Turbo Graphics, Connect, NES, Retron 3, uh, Wii Mini, Master System. And then the oldest system I own, which is cool, which is this is a, it's not a Pong machine. It's called Atari Video Pinball. It's a basic pinball game and a breakout clone. Uh, but this is from 1976, which is a year before the Atari 2600. It is the oldest video game thing I own and it's in mostly good condition. The only issue I have with it is that uh, I need to reattach the, the wires and the speaker. This is where the magic happens in here. Okay, enough of that crap. So uh, we actually have some more overflow storage in the closet. Again, I organized this just for y'all. Yes, I actually live in here. We have a vintage boom box I got for Toonie. We have my Amiibos, we have assorted game boxes, my Sonic Mania statues, uh, some Pokemon Electric Tail of Pikachu comics that are sealed. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll ever open them. And then this really nice VHS tape holder that I use to hold SNES games. Uh, and then above that actually, in this briefcase here, this is where I keep most of my Genesis, Gen Genesis, Genesis slash Mega Drive games and Famicom games, because they all fit real nicely, except for like the weird, oddly big ones. If we go next to that, we have my Sega Pico and my GameCube games. Uh, and I think some standout titles, I guess among all of these in here, would be my copy of Earthbound, which, uh, yes, is an actual official copy, and then also my copy of Mega Man The Wily Wars, which I know just got an official repro that is an unofficial repro. And then going over to the GameCube, we have uh, my original copy of Animal Crossing, and also Obama. That, that's... That. That doesn't say Obama. It says Obama. I know what I, know what I read. Actually, uh, if you want something that I think is legitimately really cool, these are super common, but uh, I'm kind of all here for it. I actually have a couple of GameCube bonus discs. Uh, I have the Pokemon Coliseum bonus disc, which you can actually use to spawn unlimited Jirachis for your friend. I'm not even kidding that if you have a GBA to GameCube adapter, you can do that. And also this GameCube preview disc, which is really cool because it has Sonic Adventure, Beautiful Joe, uh, Billy Hatcher, and Soul Calibur 2 demos on it, which was super cool back in the day. I also have all of my Japanese GameCube games, all three of them. Uh, let me grab those. Oh, that was me knocking my old phone off there because yes, I keep my old cell phone around because uh, I can use it as a smart TV remote because it has an IR blaster. I have Japanese Sonic Heroes, which was a donation from my buddy G to Next Level. Uh, the Japanese exclusive remake of Bonk's Adventure, which was a Turbo Graphics game, which uh, I got from Tyler I. Archer Gamer. And then also the Japanese version of the Sonic Gems collection because uh, Streets of Rage 3 is really hard to find, and for some reason, just on the Japanese version, all three Streets of Rage games are on here, along with all the Sonic games. I don't know why they put a bunch of Streets of Rage stuff on a Sonic collection, but whatever, I vibe. Finally, I'd like to bring note to my Funko Pops. Notice how I only have a few. That's how you're supposed to buy them. Um, if you are one of those collectors who has like a wall of Funko Pops, trust me, therapy has done wonders for me. <laughs> now here's the main 
the, the main attraction for today's video. This is my office, denoted by this really nice Pokemon doormat that I totally don't just have there to conceal seal part of a hundred foot long ethernet cable. And so let, let's go in. This is my actual office, my game room. Yes, in here, spare film equipment. And here though, Bidja games. All of these are Amiga joysticks and mice, all of them. Literally all of them, except for this thing. This, this is this is for the Z board. I've never played WoW, but I kind of want to do a video on this. Like, y'all, y'all have to take a look at this. This is the Z board, right? And it's a keyboard, and it's the worst keyboard I've ever used because it's meant to have like changeable keys. They feel terrible. They feel really god awful. And it's easy to see why uh, it failed and why I was literally given this by friends from a game store. In this ottoman, we have PC games, PS2 games, and Game Wave games. Uh, also, a few 360 games. I see Beautiful Katamari and E6 in there. Let's talk handhelds. This is the first of my handhelds. I have a hand just hanging from there because it's in a pouch. And this is my blue. Sega Game Gear. I actually own two Game Gears. This one I want to mod and put a DS screen in it because, uh, yeah, this was given my, by my brother-in-law. This was his childhood Game Gear. The postal man decided to throw it and it shattered the screen. But that's fine because you can put a DS screen in these and I already have a completely recapped Game Gear of the original screen, as we'll see uh, if we look into the closet. So here we have uh, all, most of my handhelds. We have the Gizmondo. We have the Nomad, we have uh, an Intex Galaxian 2, both of my Neo Geo Pocket Colors. So, uh, yeah, I do own every single model of DS. I own every model of 3DS, except for the 3DS XL, which, uh, or the new 3DS XL, which my fiance owns. And yes, that Atari Lynx box, that Game Boy box, and that both of those Game Boy boxes and that Game Gear box uh, have actual systems in them. Actually, it's really funny. Uh, before I did what I do now for a living, which is mostly journalism, I actually came from a video editing background. And my very first uh, like self-employed gig as a video editor was doing a video for a family friend who paid me. He was like, hey, he's like, I know you like games. I can either pay you cash or I can pay you in a bunch of boxed Atari Lynx stuff. <laughs> which is how I got all of that stuff. Uh, and it might not sound like a ton, but no, he gave me like $400 worth of Atari stuff. Uh, so we also have Xbox, uh, PSP, PS3, and PS4 in there. Standouts I'd say would be Conker's Live and Reloaded, um, any of the East games, and also a few of the bootleg systems like the Dingu and the Kecheota game phone. And even my a couple of Tiger handhelds. My favorite thing in there, though, is this, which is this official Nintendo 64 fanny pack. Which is actually, like, no joke, this is not only official from Nintendo, but it's the perfect size so that you can fit two games in the back and a controller in the front. Which, I gotta be honest, you know, I, th I can think of nothing more horrifically 90s than this. I need to give that to my partner. <laughs> you do. You, I mean, I think if you want a good divorce, I think that's a very great gift. <laughs> all right, so let's go along here. This is my shelves. We have all most of my like CD size games in here. We have Saturn and PC Engine slash Turbo Graphics here. We have, uh, we have regular like DOS PC games and also like miscellaneous like multi-disc PS1 Super Adventure Rockman because it's the only big Saturn game I have like that next to Grandia and also my one singular CDI game I don't even own a CDI but it was a Toonie so I'm like I'm not gonna say no uh let's see we have regular PS1 and over here we have Dreamcast including my, my favorite Dreamcast story Choo Choo Rocket I own the European version I own the Japanese version. I don't own the American version. And uh, the, the Dreamcast is, uh, it's region locked. What, what region? American. <laughs> so let's go, go through all the stuff I have here. We have 
uh, Xbox 360 HD DVD drive that goes with one there. A general Blu-ray player that I just got for free when I got my TV. Uh, original Xbox, my childhood Wii, the Dreamcast, TI-99 4A, the Ouya, which I, for the, just so I have it on record, is the worst game system I've ever used. The PC Engine plus Super CD-ROM unit, Super Famicom, PS2, and Sharp Twin Famicom. Uh, in these boxes here, we have a full-size replica of the Master Sword and Hylian Shield from Zelda and also my university diploma uh, because where else am I going to put them? Below that, in the box, we have a Commodore VIC-20 computer, the Game Wave, a VCR, the Sega Saturn, uh, my Pathfinder stuff, a Polaroid camera in the case that actually belongs to my fiance, and then uh, in those boxes, nicely kept, most, with the exception of ones I've been playing, I, I just threw in there directly before filming this, and I can absolutely turn this around again. Mostly kept in plastic bags, um, uh, my controllers and my system cables. So if we go over here, we have my Mega setup. Originally, I wanted this thing on for this video because it's really cool. But this computer is so loud. This is an Amiga 2000. I actually did a video a while back where I restored this. Uh, and that China box down there, that's all my loose floppy disks. Most of them are copied floppies, I know. Uh, don't, don't, don't do a piracy, kiddos. But yeah, that's a 1084S monitor. Uh, we have some like Famicom disk system games and stuff in there because yes, I have a disk system. Uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. Look at this Xenoblade standee I also got from G. Uh, but yeah, this is a, a German Amiga 2000, uh, and it's very loud. Also on display is I have my big box PC games. All so finally, uh, here's my main stream setup. Uh, this is my PC down here. It is a big beefy boy. Camera woman helped me build it. Yeah, fucking dead. Yeah, um, and yeah, I have some nice window dressings. I have a ColecoVision and a Japanese GameCube there. But I have two monitors, uh, just 1080p, but one is high refresh rate, the other is curved. I use this for editing. And the systems in my stream setup are the PS5, which I won from a contest, the another Switch dock, and yes, I do have an Animal Crossing Switch. It's actually Xander's. I don't, ugh, everything is so white! Mood. Uh, and then the Wii U and the Retro Freak, and then right below that is all my DS and 3DS stuff. And you know, it's, I try to keep it as neat as I can. Uh, if you're wondering why there's a random pop filter there, I only have one decent mic, and that's the one I'm currently using for this video. So it's currently mounted on top of the camera. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. That, I guess that's it. Um, oh, I do have my most recent console as well. And actually, I want to show something funny. So, comrades, I have, I have a question for you, comrades. I used to work for a gum for a video company I will not name because they're kind of crappy. And as for a prop for a video I never even got to do, they, I got this from them, which is a Soviet-style Yushanka, because I was set to do a video on this, which is the Dendi, which is a Soviet clone of the Nintendo Famicom. Or I guess not Soviet, or technically Soviet. 1990, I think, is the year on this that, one. That's Soviet, yeah. Technically Soviet. You know, like we're talking, we're talking like the the coup Soviet. Yeah, like end of the Soviet Union Soviet. Uh, what's interesting is this Famicom I got from a store called Game Deals in uh, Vancouver, and they actually gave me a couple things of it as well because I really like bootleg games, and uh, I actually got this for free. This is Mario Four. This is a bootleg most people have never even heard of. I really want to do a video on it sometime. I think I might call it something like The Secret of Mario 4. Um, so this Famicom looks legit from this angle, right? Yeah. This is actually a bootleg. And the only way you can tell is because it has turbo buttons on it. Oh. And also, but also this bootleg is better than the original because the original Famicom only had RF. This one also has AV. That's good. And then I also have a 10 terabyte desktop hard drive underneath all those games I've been playing on the desk. And that's because a big thing I've been doing with a lot of videos as of late is if I'm filming, I'll go ahead and I'll 
uh, save all my B-roll or just take random B-roll of consoles and just always have it on hand to refer to in later videos. Same goes for gameplay. If I capture gameplay for a video, I don't delete it once I'm done editing. I back it up because say I'm doing a video on, uh, I see it on the screen over there on, on, on Freedom Planet and I need to quickly mention something like Ghosts and Goblins on the Amiga. Well, if I already have footage of Ghosts and Goblins and Amiga, I think it's easier to just pull like five seconds from a previous playthrough that I might have shown in another video instead of recording new gameplay just for like a five second mention. So on that note, who's ready for some Q&A shenanigans? Me. Alright, so how's it going folks? Here we are on my gamer couch. It's just my regular couch I usually do all my filming from. Uh, yeah, this is pretty weird. I can't remember the last time I did an off-the-cuff thing. Something I didn't show is I actually have a teleprompter now that I often use whenever I decide to do something on camera. But yeah, these are questions viewers sent me. Uh, it's really, I'm really excited to do q and I haven't in a while. I know people have pretty easy access to me in general via like Discord and Twitter. And like, I run a podcast with open emails. But still, I'm excited to answer, answer your questions live or I guess uh, live for me right now on video. So yeah, let's do it. All right, so I'm going to say them. You don't know who I am. Well, maybe some of you know who I am. Uh, my first, the first question's from me. Mm -hmm. Third worst console you've ever owned. Okay, so this one I actually really had to think about. That was the point. Because the first two are obvious. The first is the Ouya, because the Ouya is garbage. The second is the Hyperscan, which is a console that tried to combine trading cards and disc-based games, and it really didn't work. Imagine a fighting game where you have to, like, scan in, like, an NFC. Basically, imagine if Smash Brothers required you to, like, use an amiibo for every character you wanted to play as. Uh, but the third worst, and I know I'm going to ruffle some feathers with this, is the Wii Mini. I say the Wii Mini for a reason. The original Wii, and even the second model Wii, Fine, you can output over component if you want. You can play GameCube games on the first model. But the thing is that the Wii Mini came out in 20, 2011, 2012. At that point, for about 70 or 80 bucks, and I know this because, uh, you know, I went with my brother-in-law at one point then to get a Wii, you, you could buy a used Wii. The Wii Mini was a stripped down Wii that couldn't even go online. That was $100 new. And also that for the first six months of its life was exclusive to Canada. And I love living here. I really do. But I don't trust any game console that's exclusive to here. All right. Question two from Acrobatic Jazz on Twitter. I just confirmed you're trans and I'm so happy. I'm trans too, by the way. Oh, so am I. Oh, hey. So I have some questions. Uh, question one. You're the only trans YouTuber I know. Are you planning on covering any trans related video game topics soon? Now... Translated video game topics is a very broad thing, and I'm going to be honest and say this. I know I've done documentary series and such in the past. I know I've interviewed trans folks. Like recently on the Speedrun podcast, we had Sabrina, uh, Sabrina Dodaro, who is the head of Galaxy Trail, who, Trail, who of course made uh, Freedom Planet and the upcoming Freedom Planet 2. But I didn't see that as, oh, I'm having her on the podcast because she's trans. It was, oh, I'm having her on the podcast because she's someone in the industry I really respect who I think is really good at what she does. For someone who covers trans issues in gaming specifically, I think Kim Justice does a way better job at that than I do. She's also a trans retro-focused YouTuber, and she does really fantastic content. As for me, though, um, of course, a lot of my, fo my friends are also uh, queer, you know, like me. And obviously I'm going to keep doing videos with them. But the goal of Stuff We Play has been and probably always will be to cover things that are weird and retro or at the very least that are game related and that I find to be really cool, which more often than not also happens to be weird and retro. And so will I absolutely try to uplift folks in the community? Yes. But am I going to focus on trans topics? No. All right. Great answer. Uh, question two. What do you think about mobile games like Pokemon Go and Mario Kart Tour specifically? Actually, Pokemon Go I really loved. Like, the first summer it came out, great. Super fun. And then I kind of fell off, and then my nephew got into it, and obviously if a five-year-old is into the game, says, Aunt Jamie, play Pokemon Go with me, I'm gonna play Pokemon Go, duh. 
but I kind of stopped playing again because the issues with the basic amount of Pokemon storage they give you now, you can't actually catch them all unless you buy more storage space, which kind of defeats the purpose of Pokemon to me. Like, I get it, it's like, oh, it's like, you know, only a couple bucks for more storage, but I'm like... As for Mario Kart Tour or like the, the mobile Dr. Mario game, uh, I thought they were trash. Our next question comes from good old Jazzy. Uh, who is our best corporate sponsor and why is it Ubisoft? Okay, I need to give... So for those wondering, Jazzy is my co-host over on Speedrun. We are... Uh, the, the podcast has nothing to do with speedrunning, just gets named because our episodes average 15 to 20 minutes on average, which is very short for a podcast. Folks seem to like it, though. We're uh, apparently, according to, to a few sources, one of... At, at the very least, like, the only gaming podcast hosted by two trans women, but also apparently one of the fastest growing podcasts in our niche in Canada, which is very cool. So I'm part of the Ubisoft Canada Guild, which uh, means that basically... Uh, I'm I get to be in a nice group chat with a bunch of other great Canadian based con uh, creators and get to do stuff with, with Ubisoft and they uh, send me games and merch on occasion like most notably as of late I've been playing through Immortals Phoenix Rising on PS5 which is great and I'm trying to set up a thing with them right now and I'm going to go ahead and mention it since they didn't say couldn't mention it that uh, we're hope since speedrun is about to reach another download milestone and also that we're going to be recording episode 50 in the coming month or so uh we're hoping to do a giveaway of several copies of immortals phoenix rising which of course ubisoft canada not ubisoft the american branch but like ubisoft canada specifically is helping to make possible and that's really awesome of, of them and like they, they aren't sponsoring this video at all just uh I legitimately really like working with them. I think they're a good company. All right, next question. Um, your mother asks, why aren't you coming over for Shabbos dinner anymore? Because the freaking U.S. border has been closed for a year and a half. Okay, the next two questions are from Joni. Uh, I can't read the at for Twitter from here, but first question, how do you go about coming up with or scheduling video topics? For scheduling video topics, oh, with the exception of Mega May, which I just got done, where I tried to get seven videos done in the span of a month, just because I had to take some unexpected breaks from YouTube throughout 2020, so this is my attempt to kind of re-kickstart the channel. But uh, I just try to schedule at least two videos a month, and what really helps with that is because of my day job I'm working as well right now, I'm able to hire my, or rather I think the correct term is commission, my buddy Trey to help me, uh, you know, edit basically uh, videos every once in a while and it's nice and for those wondering I pay my day rate yeah you know as for coming up with video ideas uh shooting the shit with friends like honestly just calling up or like hanging out with Ellie or playing games with Jazzy or just going on a Sega rant with G that's pretty much how I come up with ideas like yeah, why don't I do a video on the Game Boy Color IR sensor? Who who the hell else is gonna talk about it on YouTube, you know? Camera woman's laughing. And <laughs> don't don't laugh at my pain. Uh question two. How do you deal with games that are predominantly in another language like Super Adventure Rockman, especially if no translation guide is available? So Super I noticed you use Super Adventure Rockman as an example, and the funny thing is despite that game being so obscure that if I remember right for the longest time, like its Wikipedia page was like a paragraph. I found an English Game Facts guide. As for games that are not in English though, and that have no translation guide for it, uh, honestly, I either phone someone up I know who can translate it, or I just make myself suffer for, through it, because, I, because let's be honest, people on YouTube enjoy suffering, you know? The next one is from Xander. You know who they are. Yeah, my fiance. Favorite oh, yeah. movie based game, not counting Shrek. I mean, if I'm gonna be legit, I wouldn't choose any of the Shrek games. I, I, none of them. But it's all right. Maybe Super Slam's good, but like. Shrek 2 on the PC is fine. I've never played the PC one. It, it's it's actually bad, but I liked it. Actually, thanks to Xander, I uh, a while back I tried Nightmare Before Christmas on Game Boy Advance, and it's a Symphony of the Night clone. And a pretty decent one at that, actually. So yeah, I'd probably say that one. Another close personal one, uh, Skylar says, 
Favorite physical board game in a video game franchise? For example, like Legend of Zelda Monopoly, if you have one. So, I've actually played a few. Funny enough, most of the ones I've played are Sonic. Uh, Sonic Dice Rush. Uh, Sonic Crash Course was really fun uh, I, when I played that with G and Jenny back. It was me, Xander, G and Jenny back a while. I think there was a video of it. If I had to say favorite, though, I know this is going to be a dumb one, but... For Christmas a few years back, uh, my sister got me Jenga Donkey Kong Edition. I just like Jenga. It's stupid fun. All right, the next one is from good old G. Mm -hmm. What is the biggest piece of advice that current Jamie would give past Jamie? Just freaking come out. Dude, you're, hurt. <laughs> you're hurting yourself. Like, you're, you're unhappy. Don't grow the sad beard. You don't like it. The comment section thinks it's ugly. And then, and then when you shave it anyways, people for like six months are like, what happened to the beard? Why do you shave the beard? And then like half the comment section before was like, the beard is ugly. And I'd be like, I know. I grew the beard because I'm sad. Because because I can't be trans, right? Oh, honey. I mean, at least you could grow the fucking dysphoria beard. I couldn't even do that shit. Yeah, but it was a dysphoria beard, you know? I had dysphoria scruffle and it was somehow more pathetic. I look, and the thing is, well, is like when I had the beard, I didn't like the feeling of having a mustache. So I had a, I looked like a freaking Abe Lincoln cosplayer. <laughs> Got another one here from Skylar. Is there anything slash anyone that has inspired you that you didn't expect or wouldn't have expected? Uh, yeah. So a lot of the channels that inspired me, you know, I've been watching since before I was a you, you know, YouTuber. So f I know he's a bigger channel, but I only discovered Brutal Moose's videos in like the past couple years. His, and I really love his thing where he's, he just does whatever the hell. He's like, all right, PC game review? Sure. Am I going to go watch some old VHS tapes and then film, film myself with a VHS camcorder? Sure. Am I going to review freaking Kid Cuisine? Sure. I really admire that. I mean, I feel like that's reflected in the channel. Like, uh, I feel like his, he has a more consistent style while I kind of range from being either kind of some call me johnny ask to being kind of like gaming historian ask and i usually fall somewhere in the middle but you know i really but i don't feel bad about being a variety channel in that sense even if it means i'm not you know the most seo friendly thing ever which whatever i you know again this is my channel to do what i want with and i you know he just seeing him do his thing made me feel really happy and comfortable just doing my thing the next one is from Xander again. Mm -hmm. What advice that's maybe even impractical would you give someone who's wanting to get into content creation but is scared or worried about it? I mean, I know it's, it's very obvious and cheesy, but just go for it. Will your first few videos be bad? Honestly, looking back at my original self, yes, they absolutely will be. But you need to get past that because you need to get past that phase of getting comfortable on camera and stuff because after a bit you just kind of do. You know, and whether you have a friend behind a camera or you're just talking to yourself, you get used to it. And not only do you get used to it, but in a way it becomes oddly cathartic after a while. It's very comforting, I find. Alright, and the next question here is, has there ever been a comment that stuck with you, good or bad? Um, there've been two in particular. Uh, one was, uh, one up John, who's someone I really like on Twitter, he's a cool dude. I remember I was like, oh, maybe I should do a video on the Sega Pico. And like every few months, he'd just drop a comment of, when are we getting a Pico video, Jamie? Until I finally did it last year. So there is that. Uh, more recently, though, I'm so glad I have Xander also helping me with comment moderation because I did a video with G on Google Stadia and uh, the, the folks who are really big on Stadia didn't like that we weren't big into Stadia. And when I say they really didn't like that we weren't into Stadia, I mean like... Uh, they really didn't like it. As in, someone sent me a death threat. So that's fun. My favorite is uh, when we did the video together and someone said, I seemed like the perfect girlfriend. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I want, if you're watching this, whoever you are, I want you to know my real life girlfriend found that very flattering. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next one is from Robert. Million dollar question. What got you into retro games? Specifically games from the 90s. So what got me into retro gaming in general 
I mean, if we're going all the way back, it was Mega Man 9 coming out and me actually just randomly trying it and be like, oh, this is actually really good and vibing with that. If we're talking game collecting though, that was randomly stumbling across uh, thrift stores, particularly near the Houston Heights, and from there going to more thrift stores and flea markets and stuff, because like, I'm not sure if, if y'all remember what game collecting was like back around 2011 to 2013, but stuff was really freaking cheap. There was this one flea market, I actually did a few early videos there called the Old Security Square, where even like when I would visit down there up to 2016, I could still find like NES consoles, original Xboxes, PS2s, uh, even Genesis consoles for like five to ten bucks each and games for under a dollar. Honestly, I'm back to that kind of collecting now. I kind of have everything I want, but if I find something that looks cool and that's really cheap, well, I might as well, right? Because like, why not, right? All right, next question is from Heidi Flora. Hey, Jamie, uh, this will be for your Q&A post, obviously. Uh, what is your favorite place in BC other than, of course, video game shops? And have you gotten to do some exploring in BC? So yeah, so okay, so let, let me tell you all a story. So, fun fact, BC is just now in like the later stages of like a lockdown-esque thing, kind of, sort of, that's coming out of, kind of, sort of. Let me tell you right now what we're doing. Yeah, you pull that up, but um... So, don't travel right now unless it's essential. Anyways, I'm from the States originally and I'm just now going for permanent residency. And for my final thing I need for permanent residency, I basically had an option of, alright, wait until potentially a year and do it in Victoria, or do it in two weeks but go to Vancouver. So I unexpectedly in the span of two weeks booked a hotel, booked a seaplane, booked an 8am appointment for this thing, and went to Vancouver. And that time though, I basically had like an eight hour layover, so that's why I ended up stopping by Game Deals and another great Vancouver game store, uh, which I think was Press Start Video Games. It was really cool. Stanley Park was freaking incredible though. Uh, I, I'm used to Beacon Hill Park in Victoria, which in my opinion, I might be biased because I've lived in Victoria for so much of my life, but like, I think Beacon Hill is a prettier park, but still. I was like, oh, Stanley Park's not gonna be that big. Yeah, I'll do a whole walk around it. So it was a 10 kilometer walk. Oh, yes. No, keep going. Oh, go on. Keep going. Uh, I was just gonna tell you, uh, we it's Victoria Day. Yeah. So the government isn't coming out with any news. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> We're still in a lockdown. We're still in a lockdown. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Non-video game places in Victoria specifically though, uh, I can't recommend the National Toy Museum of Canada enough at Cherry Bomb Toys. I think they're reopening in June, which is when this video is going out. So if you ever get a chance to go to Victoria, check them out. They're near Broad Street. They're only a couple blocks from the water. And uh, they're also near a lot of restaurants since they're just in the heart of downtown. Sonic, Sonic will not stay up. Just, just, just give up, Jamie. Oh, oh no. Oh no. Oh no. It all collapses. So, what's the next question? Next question is from Ron mm -hmm. Uh Why is there always a creepy babysitting mama doll in your background? <laughs> so, this right here is, their name is Riley. Thank you very much, they have a name. And yes, they do fit in Build-A-Bear clothes. I've tried. So, how I got them is Epic Games and More in Victoria, BC. Shop I talk about a lot, if only because the folks who run it are cool people. So, they actually got a copy of Babysitting Mama on the Wii in and Ten dollars, please get rid of it. So I was like, all right, well, what am I gonna do with a baby that that has a Wiimote slot in its booty hole? So I put it behind me. All right, the Andy Panda asks, what is the rarest piece of gaming merch that you own? Which is the most expensive? All right, y'all, I have three different. Sonic, get get your. Sonic will not stay. Sonic, Sonic will not. Just Sonic, remain. you can you can go here next to Evie. So I have three different things I can talk about here. And I'm gonna grab all three right now. If we are talking about gaming merch in general, then it's definitely the standee for Xenoblade Chronicles 3D that like with a lot of rare game stuff I have. Uh, I got from G. Specifically, I got this because I traded Jenny, his uh, his wife, a copy, a boxed Japanese copy of Pokemon Pinball. And they're like, we don't know what to give you in return. Do you like Xenoblade? I freaking love Xenoblade Chronicles. So uh, this is cool. But if we're talking game systems, for rarest systems, I have two things. The first is 
the Nokia Engage prototype here. I did a video on this. This is a prototype system. As far as I know, potentially one of a kind. If not, at the very least, there's only a few of these about. I can't put a value on this even because of just how rare it is. That said, for systems that actually made it pr to production, it's funny because I this one, I don't even have a battery for it or any games. This is the Gizmondo. These things, even without batteries and stuff in it, are worth hundreds of dollars. Um, not the most expensive thing I own, granted. I mean, I think the, the Amiga probably dwarfs anything else I own in price because of how complete that setup is. But if we're talking individual systems, this one's definitely the rarest and hardest to find and potentially the most expensive. They were only available from mall kiosks in a few select cities in North America. And the company went on under in only a few years after this was released. And the guy who was in charge of it both crashed a one-of-a-kind Ferrari and also had Swedish Mafia ties. Which means that by extension, the Swedish Mafia helped fund a, a game console that's main title was called Sticky Balls. Next question is from Primetime Eric Prime. You've been revisiting a lot of topics lately and it's been fun. Are there any topics that you do not want to revisit? Stadia. Next question again comes from Xander. Is there anything you know now that you wish you knew when you started doing video content? What is it and how would you like content creators just starting out to fold it into their content so they don't make the same mistakes? So, all right, I'm gonna say this. Being consistent, whether it's consistent in subject matter or consistent in style, or just consistent in tone. Like if you notice my videos, I, I tend to have a very consistent tone. Like I'm not, I feel like I bring a certain level of energy to all my videos, but I'm not like, you know, super hyperactive, ah, oh, Raid Shadow Legends, you know. What I'd say is, you know, having some sort of consistency to your videos is way more important than playing the SEO game and playing the algorithm game. Especially because if you're being consistent with it and you're covering stuff you, you actually find interesting, then, you know, I think you're still, people will come. Also, by the way, people can tell when you're just playing the algorithm game and when you don't actually care what you're talking about, make videos you'd actually watch. All right, next question. Are you gay? Uh, pan? And follow up, does your mom know you gay? I don't know, does your mom know you gay? M my mom's dead. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last four. We're going to do them rapid fire from Princess Peachy here. Uh, first question, what's your favorite gaming generation of all time? Favorite gaming generation of all time is I forget the number of it, but it's the one that's right around the turn of the millennium, and it's the one that had the Dreamcast, PS2, Xbox, and GameCube. I want to say that's the... Is, is that fifth? Six? Hold on. Uh, Ad Adam Corlett, please help fifth. me. I'm wearing your shirt. <laughs> okay, two. Best So Bad It's Good game that you've played. Best so bad it's good game I played is I Love You Colonel Sanders, which is a dating sim by KFC. All right. Number three, favorite non-Mario platformer game or series? I mean, obviously I'm biased towards both Mega Man and Sonic, so but but I'm gonna exclude both of those as well. So no Mario, no Sonic, no Mega Man, even if it's like a weird Mega Man spinoff. And I am probably gonna go with I know it's a, a really freaking obvious one to go for, but Little Samps on NES. So y'all say, but Jamie, how did you play Little Samps? Is that like a $1,200 game? Well, good. The, the good news is that I own a totally legitimate 151 Famicom Multicart that has Little Samson on it, and uh, it's a great game. Uh, I'm, I'm sure this is very legitimate. Nintendo, please don't sue me. Uh, number four, last one of the whole Q&A. Any HD ports that you're still hoping might come to Switch? Let me think about that one for a sec, because, I mean, we got Miitopia, which is cool. I'm not going to pay full price for it, though, because I I bought my 3DS copy on sale for seven bucks at London Drugs. Uh, hmm. If I could get any game with an HD port, I would love a double pack of Pokemon Coliseum and XD. Like, you don't even have to do much... Just like upscale them like you did for Mario 3D All-Stars. I don't care if it's full price. Do it and let me transfer the, po the the shadow Pokemon I catch to Pokemon Home. That's it. That's all I ask. Or you can even do some proprietary Pokemon box thing with it to make sure it's compatible. Just uh, Pokemon Coliseum and XD were great. And I would love 
love for them to be playable by a new generation. So, on that note, this has been pretty fun. I've been at this for five years, uh, around 20,000 subscribers, a podcast, streams, a journalism career. It's been a very odd yet cool time, a very uh, b bizarre adventure, if you will. That was a JoJo reference, but if you didn't catch it, camera woman. But anyways, on that note, if you want access to early content, extra content, early podcast episodes, or just a uh, special perks and roles and the stuff we play discord server which by the way link to that for that anyone can use to join in the description and why not become a patron patron or youtube channel member or even a paid twitch sub like these fine folks you see right here you can do it for as low as a dollar a month and I, i'd really appreciate it um, so on that note thank you very much for watching stay classy and i'll see you next time